All right, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Cody. I'm a marketing specialist here at QNAP and I'm here with our product manager, Deval. Good morning, everyone. And today we're going to be discussing how you can leverage a QNAP NAS to support video production workflows, uh, ranging from small scale projects and independent creators uh, to entire teams of editors. And we'll discuss some of the bottlenecks in production that QNAP can help alleviate, as well as uh, best practice guidelines to maintain your data. And so looking at the agenda you can see we'll start off discussing high-speed connections that come on various QNAP models and then we'll uh, we'll go over some potential deployments that could be considered uh, then we'll discuss ways in which QNAP helps you maintain uptime without interruption and strategies you can implement to foster greater server stability and after that we'll discuss data security and the measures you can take to make sure your hard work isn't lost So if we take a look here, uh, to support some smooth editing, it's important that the connection to the storage is fast. So quick throughput ensures minimal latency and is important when dealing with uh, high resolution footage to enable a smooth editing experience. Uh, QNAP is a leader in high speed uh, connections on NAS. And so as you can see here, depending on your needs, you can choose between models with 2.5 gigabit, 10 gigabit, uh, and even 25 gigabit connections, as well as Thunderbolt 3 and soon Thunderbolt 4. Uh, there are also models with PCIe slots that can support up to 100 gigabit uh, on select models. Of course, uh, to bring out the full potential of these connections, uh, other factors must also be considered, such as the number of drives in a RAID array, uh, the type of drives, and the CPU, as well as uh, the workstation you're, you're connecting with and any switches in between the workstation and the storage. So let's take a look at a few ways in which QNAP can, can be deployed uh, it, just in various environments. So first, we, ha we have just a classic typical NAS connection a NAS connecting over Ethernet to a router, and then a workstation connecting over Ethernet to that same router as well. And some NAS may have only single gigabit connections, but in recent years, more and more QNAPs are coming equipped with 2.5 gigabit. Uh, you would probably want at least that much for video editing, but uh, remember you would also need that 2.5 gigabit connection on the router and the connecting workstation uh, otherwise the speed will be bottlenecked by the slowest connection and while the connection gives you the potential for high speed connectivity it doesn't guarantee it the connection is merely the the size of the pipe or you could say it's like the size of a freeway uh, it, it can enable network traffic to move quickly but there are other factors at play so you still need the powerful cpu the fast drives uh, or many drives in a RAID to saturate your connection. Uh, the most basic QNAP models for editing start with quad-core Intel Celeron processors and include M.2 SSD slots to that you could use to create a cache or a dedicated SSD storage pool. Uh, this is basically like a bare bones setup for uh, maybe like a single editor. So looking at this second scenario here, you can see a similar setup in that there's a single editor accessing a single NAS, but in this case, the editor is accessing the NAS directly via Thunderbolt 3. Uh, this Thunderbolt connection is a Thunderbolt over IP connection, so the editor would still uh, need to mount the folder uh, rather than just seeing it appear the way an external drive would, but this still provides a connection to the NAS at very high speeds uh, and it's still pretty simple to deploy. Uh, in this example, we're looking at our upcoming Thunderbolt 4 model, uh, but we currently have a Thunderbolt 3 model that is very similar. Both include M.2 slots for faster drive speed and an Intel Celeron processor. And um, so now let's look, uh, let's start looking at a few multi-editor scenarios. Uh, in this case, 
you can see that um, we've put a 10 gigabit and 2.5, uh, uh, kind of a hybrid 10 gigabit, 2.5 gigabit switch uh, between the router and the NAS. Uh, we're going to connect, so here we're going to connect this 10 gigabit NAS to the switch via one of the switch's 10 gigabit connections. And then we could use these additional 2.5 gigabit connections to go out to the individual workstations. Uh, if we were to use just 2.5 gigabit connections, then there wouldn't be enough total bandwidth to support full 2.5 gigabit for each workstation. But the 10 gigabit connection enables multiple workstations to potentially saturate each 2.5 gigabit connection. Uh, to help saturate uh, network connections to the TS, H973AX, um, we, you can, we include uh, four 2.5 inch SSD drive bays and two of which are U.2 NVMe drive bays, uh, in addition to the five standard 3.5 inch drive bays. So you could consider either using a cache or creating multiple storage pools for the editors to work off of. And if we go on to the, the next deployment, you, here uh, we can see a setup with 10 gigabit, with a 10 gigabit connection as well as uh, Thunderbolt via a Thunderbolt adapter. This particular model, the TVS H1688X comes equipped with two 10 gigabit ports. And if we pair that with a managed 10 gigabit switch, we can set up port trunking to give a total of 20 gigabit aggregate bandwidth to be shared among connecting devices via the 10 gigabit switch. So additionally, up to two editors can connect via the Thunderbolt 3 using the PCIe expansion card. Uh, Thunderbolt 3 connections uh, typically have a 40 gigabit theoretical max speed, while uh, Thunderbolt 3 over IP, which is how connections can be made to the QNAP, has a maximum of 20 gigabits per port. This is a PCIe Gen 3x4 Thunderbolt card. So the theoretical maximum speed for that connection will be just under 32 gigabits total for both ports on the card. But this connection is still uh, plenty fast for your editors. And to make use of the high-speed connections, the TVS H1688X has 12 three and a half inch drive bays, as well as four two and a half inch drive bays, ideal for SSDs, and two M.2 NVMe SSD slots. Uh, the NAS is also equipped with a Xeon processor. And finally, we have the fastest setup of all. This is our TSH1290FX model, which comes equiped with 12 U.2 NVMe drive bays, uh, uh, M an AMD EPIC processor, and a 25 gigabit SFP28 connection built in. Uh, you could pair this with our 25 gigabit switch, which is also backward compatible with 10 gigabit SFP plus and has one 10 gigabit RJ45 port. Additionally, this unit is compatible for expansion cards to give 40 gigabit or even 100 gigabit connections. And this is via a PCIe Gen 4 by 16 expansion slot. So there's plenty of bandwidth on all fronts. Uh, this is the ultimate solution for intensive workflows, including 4K, 6K, and 8K editing. And the nice thing about it is it's a desktop model uh, rather than a rack mount. And so it, and it doesn't run uh, all that loud. And also you're running all SSD drives, so you don't have the spinning drives creating noise. It's, it's designed to be a little bit quieter and to be just, you can just put it right in your office, uh, right where your editors are working. And so I've, since we've looked at a few, uh, a few different environments that we could potentially set up, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to look at um, how we can 
maintain the workflow and maintain uptime. Uh, first off, all QNAP NAS are configurable for all of the major RAID arrays, uh, including RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID 10, RAID 50, and RAID 60. Uh, so basically, if a drive fails, you can simply put in a fresh drive to rebuild the RAID uh, without any interruption to your work. And for additional prote protection, you have the option to purchase a license for drive failure prediction. And this software uses AI to predict when a drive is likely to fail. So you can order that drive ahead of time and replace it ahead of time. Uh, and so just maintain just seamless workflow without any interruption or any issues. And we also include a snapshot technology standard on all of our NAS. And so with many editors, uh, the chances of something maybe being accidentally deleted could go up. Uh, so snapshot saves the state of your data at a point in time so that it can be rolled back to. So if a user accidentally deletes something that wasn't supposed to be deleted, you can get that file back. And next, we wanted to look at data security. Uh, of course, anytime you're dealing with large amounts of crucial data, um, crucial data security is paramount. And there are a number of steps that can be taken to ensure safe, secure data. For starters, simply uh, keeping your firmware updated can eliminate a large portion of security threats, uh, as oftentimes a vulnerability will be patched in recent firmware. Another issue is uh, how you connect your NAS to, out, to the outside world. Uh, the safest option is to keep it confined to your own network so th that it just isn't open to the internet. That's really gonna be uh, quite safe, uh, but some people may want access from the outside. Uh, so if you do, you can set up a connection via a VPN to your network or uh, a connection to the NAS via an SSL certificate. And this will give you uh, an encrypted connection to the NAS, which is gonna be much safer uh, than standard port forwarding. Uh, additionally, QNAP uh, comes equipped with Q Firewall, which adds an additional layer of protection at the NAS level beyond just your router's firewall. Uh, if your NAS does get some sort of malware, uh, QNAP has a malware remover app to help remove malware and um, security features in QNAP uh, can easily be navigated which it, within the security counselor app, which kind of consolidates uh, all of many of the security features of the NAS. And so with that, I'm going to be handing it off to Deval and he's going to give us a hands-on look uh, with a live demo. All right, thank you very much, Cody. All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Saval, I'm the product manager here at QNAP, so, and today we'll be looking, uh, today for the live demo, we have a few um, things that I would like to uh, show you that may help in uh, with the production, and uh, you know, some tips and tricks on uh, on getting the best out of your or configurations, as well as um, the how to connect via Thunderbolt connection, and also maybe a small editing session, if possible. Um, just to showcase how easy it is to when you connect a QNAP NAS. So let me share my screen again. So here we have an 872 XT, which is Thunderbolt 3 model that I've connected uh, with the QNAP NAS. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, is basically having to uh, uh, with network configuration, right? So uh, let's say um, now most of our NAS comes comes with dual uh, network connection, right? Either it could be two 10 gigabit connection or it could be two one gigabit connection. Now, if you do have a switch that actually supports, so if you have a QNAP switch, a managed switch, then you can actually take advantage of having, a, or first of all, uh, connecting both together to give you, you know, benefits of having higher bandwidth when you have multiple editors connecting to your NAS, or it can also give you redundancy. So in case of one of the connection goes down, the other connection will take over. Um, and this all happens when the NAS and the switch will work together, right? So if you have a QNAP NAS with, uh, uh, with a QNAP NAS with a QNAP switch, a managed switch, 
uh, I'll show you the configuration that you need to do to get that uh, setup going. Or if you have a, any managed switch that supports LACP or 802.3 AD, that switch will also work with this connection. First of all, uh, you have to what uh, you have to log into your switch. So uh, on the QNAP switch, you can just log in with your uh, admin login information. Should be same for other switches as well. You should look at something uh, on most of the switches. The the naming structure can be a little bit different, right? So I have QNAP connected to two one gig switches, which is two one gig network, which is a port one and four. So on QNAP switch, you have to go to link aggregation, and um, you will see your uh, link aggregation right here. On other switches, they could be also called as port, um, sorry, LSCP or 82.3 AD. Um, uh, those could be some of the wordings that may be used with other switches. So on this switch, let's say if I want to do a lag one, so you have to set up for first lagging. So you can actually set up up to four ports. If you have a QNAP NAS, actually have up to four ports. You want to do with four ports, but I just have more two ports connected. So I just have to click one and two and click on save. I'm just not going to do. I'm not going to do that today on this live demo because no, that can, um, that may refresh the network connection and I may lose network connectivity. So uh, do this when you have nothing running on the QNAP NAS or no one is accessing your QNAP NAS, right? So uh, check the two ports or four ports uh, depending upon your connection uh, to be on that LACP. And the mode should be uh, always LACP, and you can save that. Uh, save that. And once you have done that. Let me see. Okay, so 872XT, go to network and virtual switch. Under network and virtual switch, you go to interfaces, and under interfaces, you will see port trunking. Now, this will uh, this port trunking will allow you to join two network ports together. And um, when you hit add, um, it will ask you some questions. So first one, you have to select the ports. Uh, so which one you want to connect? So I'm going to select adapter two and three, which is the two connection, two ports that I connected to the switch. Once you select next. Um, so here we do have some uh, some um, options already available. So if you have so if you have if you're just using this connection, if you have a, a QNAP, another QNAP NAS, or you're just connecting two two of them directly. You can click click on JBot connection or virtual JBot, um, and that will give you the best speeds and uh, connectivity. If you have a switch that is not a managed switch and doesn't support 802.3 AD, you can actually select general switch and hit next. Um, on the general switch, when you hit next, you have the you have three different options, right? Um, you have active backup, which allows you to ju will just be as an active uh, backup. So it doesn't give you any aggregated speed. Only one NIC is active at all times. The other one will just will just be acting as um, as a backup. So if the if your primary uh, port goes down, the other switch will take over. You have the other. You have load balancing options that are available with a general switch as well. So we have balanced TLB and balanced ALB. So balanced TLB is again, uh, as you can see see right here, um, the incoming traffic. When you have a lot of incoming traffic, uh, the QNAP will actually take advantage of both the ports um, to provide you. Um, Sorry, uh, we'll provide you with benefit, uh, better benefits as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, sorry, it will give you the both benefits as well when you have incoming traffic. With, uh, uh, and it also uses MAC address as well. Uh, but if you have a switch that doesn't support MAC address as well, so then uh, MAC address um, balance transfer, uh, balance um, load balancing, then we have uh, balance ALB as well. So if you're not getting any benefits over balance TLB, so when you're using general switch, you probably cannot log into your switch and cannot check that options. So, uh, but you can, what you can do is you can perform some test and when you have multiple, so you have to remember always, you have to have multiple network computers connected to, uh, connecting to your QNAP NAS to give you the best benefit. A single computer won't take advantage of both the switch because your single computer is only using one network port. If you have a computer that has actually has two network ports, then it may be able to take advantage, but, uh, but then you also have to set up port trunking on that switch as well. But I'm just talking about, uh, multiple editors logging into the QNAP NAS and uh, balance TLB. And then when you log into multiple QNAP, uh, or multiple editors are logging in and they're not getting much advantage or the QNAP is only using one port, maybe try balance ALB as well. Uh, and maybe that will allow you to, because balance ALB will use incoming IP4 traffic. So um, that will actually, that may be able to, your search may be able to respond better using balance ALB as well. 
So try balanced TLB and balanced ALB if you have a switch that is not that is not able to support, or it's, a, it's not a managed switch, or it doesn't support 802.380, or it doesn't support LACP. So maybe try doing those options, and uh, that will give you benefits. Again, remember, you have to use multiple computers to give you the best advantage. A single computer won't take advantage of having multiple ports. Okay, uh, going back, if you do have managed switch that support 802.380, then you may want to uh, then just set up uh, 802.380 dynamic, and that will give you the switch. That will give you the best uh, um, the best performance out of all these options, right? Uh, you can actually use balance uh, XOR or balance RR if you want to do uh, if you want to do round robin. Uh, if your switch supports that better, but um, on what we have seen in the past, 802.380 dynamic gives you the best performance if you do if you have a switch that actually supports that option. So select balanced ALB, uh, sorry, uh, 802.3 AD and hit apply. And once you hit apply, the QNAP will now use, uh, now what, what you're gonna see right here, uh, let me actually set it, set this up and if, if, it, do, if it does go down, uh, we can always disable that again. Uh, uh, you can actually set up layer two back and IP or layer two, two and three. I would recommend layer two and three. So if it, it gives you the best, uh, best configuration out of uh, both of them. Hit yes. So, and now let me set up the L lag as well right here. So one and four, I think that was the, uh, yeah, one and four, hit save. And uh, so the port trunking should be set up. So QNAP should now be reloading. So what you're gonna see is instead of having two IP addresses, QNAP will only give you one IP address for both network adapters. And now, and then you just have to use that IP address to give to and give the give them to all the uh, all the editors, and they will now be able to uh, connect with that. So you can actually, as you can see right here, it actually shows you aggregated speed of two gigabits per second. So that uh, and it's going to be the same IP address. So thus, 10.15.138.27, you can give this to all the editors, and and what they just have to log into this IP address, and QNAP and Switch will work together. To use both the both the ports on the switch and the and the NAS to give you the best benefit. So if you have maybe one of the editors will use port one, the other one will use port two, or so on and so forth. But QNAP and switch will work together to load balance the the high traffic that's coming from multiple computers and give you the best benefits. And if you have 10 gigabit connectivity, it actually can theoretically can, can theoretically it can go go it can go up to 20 gigabits. If you have four ports, it can actually go to 40 gigabits per second as well. So that that is a uh, so that's the benefit of having port trunking and a switch that actually supports port trunking. We recommend QNAP switch again because it does support that and actually supports up to four ports together. Now, so next option what we'd like to show you is so. This is one of the tips and tricks that we recommend is uh, port trunking. The other tip and trick, if you act, especially when using 10 gigabit, 100 gigabit, 40 gigabit connection, what we recommend is higher jumbo frames per second, especially for video editing as well. We recommend having higher jumbo frames per second. Uh, if you're using one gigabit connection, you may not need to change the settings, but if, especially if you're using 10 gigabit connector, connection, I recommend this setting. So jumbo frame will allow you to actually have higher packets um, uh, higher packets that uh, QNAP and computer will uh, support that, and the switch is automatically configured. The switch you don't need to uh, you don't need to set up jumbo frames on the switch. On the, actually on the QNAP switch, QNAP switch can actually check. Uh, uh, you can actually go under uh, uh, ports configuration and actually um, yeah, you can actually see right here it doesn't uh, have that option. Uh, the speed is automatically configured. Uh, but if you have uh, another switch, you may actually have to set up a uh, jumbo frame on the on the switch uh, as well. But on the QNAP on the QNAP switch, you don't need to configure that. You just have to go to QNAP NAS, go to configure, and change the jumbo frame to my 9000. All right. Once you set uh, once you set up that 9000 uh, on the QNAP on the QNAP NAS side, you also have to set that up on. I'm not going to change that live right now. But once you change it on the QNAP NAS side, you actually have to go to your computer and actually have to set it up on the computer as well. On all the computers that the QNAP will be using, you have to set up your jumbo frame to 9,000. So on the Mac, you have to go to network, 
select the so i have a thunderbolt i think yeah i have this uh, network connected go to advanced uh, i think it's under hardware and then go to manual and then right here you can set the jumbo frame to 9000 and on the unfortunately i don't have a, a windows computer to show you in the live demo but it's under network adapter settings and under uh change the network adapter and under advanced there should be an option to change the jumbo frame to 9000 on the windows computer as well but you have to remember you have to set that up on the computer as well as on the nas to, to get the best advantage if you have uh, if you did not set on the computer, you may actually have some errors or disconnection between the QNAP NAS and the computer if the jumbo frame is not set up correctly on the on the QNAP itself, or on the computer or on the NAS. So you have to make sure or ensure that both computers and the switch, sorry, computer switch and the NAS are all on the same jumbo frames. Especially when you're using 10 gigabit connectivity, you always want to make sure you have 9,000 set up. Right. For one gigabit connectivity, you don't need to change the settings. It, uh, um, it won't give you a better advantage over uh, over any other uh, selecting any other settings. But especially when you're using 10 gigabit or above, you want to change. You want to ensure that using 9000 at your jumbo frame. So that are some. So those are some tips and tricks for setting up your network. Uh, the next I want to show you is. Um, storage and set, snapshot settings. So when you, especially when using the NAS for video editing or on a video production, uh, you want to ensure that you setting up your cache. Especially when you have a NAS that actually using, uh, that actually uses hard drives and SSDs or hybrid setup, where you have multiple hard drives and and then you also have SSDs. Right here, I have um, on this demo, I have different, I have two different configurations. I'm going to go through. I have disk four through eight. I have set up as a hard drive, regular hard drive. And then one through uh, three is uh, SSD drives. Um, now this is an 872 XC. It actually also supports uh, M.2s as well. Now, when you have a hybrid setup, you have two different options to select between uh, to set up your network and uh, your storage configuration. First is Q tier. So right here. Oh, I'm sorry. So right here you have Q tier options, and then you have SSD caching. So let me explain what uh, the differences between those two are. So when you're using um, when you're using Q tier, QNAP will actually use those SSD as part of your storage pool. So right here, um, I have um, as I mentioned, I have uh, so the storage pool is uh, disk four and four through seven. It's a six terabyte disk uh, on all these um, on all this four through seven, and then I have. Uh, I think two terabyte of SSD volume. So, um, and both are set up on RAID 5. So if you go to manage and you will see RAID group one and two. So RAID group one, which is the four disc, which is a regular spinning hard drive. And then this one through three would be the SSD drives. So what QNAP Q tier will do is we'll actually join both of them together to give you a a large storage pool that consists of both regular hard drive and SSD drives, and both will be on different rate groups. So what the benefit of having this particular option is, whatever data you use the most, Kina will automatically transfer that data into the SSD drive. So in these, uh, so Kina will use the rate group for SSD drive to give you the, will, will transfer all the hardest data that you actually use. For cold data that you're actually not using currently, QNAP will, stay, will store that data within the hard drive. The benefit of having that, having this setup is now uh, you don't need to manually transfer data into SSD drives or into S, uh, or into hard drive. QNAP understands what data you're going to be using a lot. That data will automatically be transferred into the into the SSD drives, and whatever data you use the least will be state will stay in the uh, hard drive. So the benefit of having this is that you can actually have large storage large uh, storage capacity. So you have up to 16.35 terabyte of storage. And for high speed connection, I actually have 3.13 terabytes. So because I'm not all my data I'm going to be using at the same time, right? Not all 16 or 19 terabyte of data I'm going to be using at the same time. My my current projects may be smaller. So QNAP will put that data in a smaller SSD drive. But as steam as because it's a NAS device, I want to have I want to ensure that I have a large storage capacity so all my all my projects are still have and has still space 
to be stored within the NAS. So QNAP will use the high, capac uh, the high capacity hard drives to store your, uh, your different projects, right? Now, people who will get the most benefit of having Q-tiering is who used, who are, so for video editors who, who work on the same project for over, uh, on the same project for multiple days. So if you're using the same project, let's say you, you're working on an advertisement or you're working on a movie or you're working on a clip, uh, but you, you, you're you working on that same project for over a few days, right? Uh, and then once you're done with that project, you then start with another project that again, that project goes for a few more days. So those are the users who will get the best advantage because QNAP will require some time to understand what data you use a lot, right? So once it understands what data you're going to be using a lot, then the QNAP will, will start transferring that data into the SSD drives. And then once you're done with the project, the QNAP understands you can start with the next project. So QNAP will start transferring the old project into the hard drive and the new project will, will be transferred back into the hard into the SSD drive. So, but again, QNAP needs some time to understand that. So, uh, so QNAP, we recommend users who actually work on the same project for over a few days, we recommend using, will be Q-tiering will be for those users only. For users who use a lot of random uh, projects in the same day, a lot of users are using different projects. They're small, smaller clips. They're not, they're not using, uh, they're not using the same file over and over again for for a few few days. They just work on random projects at the same time. Then SSD caching of uh, are for those users, and I'll explain that in a few moments. But again, so tiering schedule again will uh, QNAP will automatically uh, start uh, start tiering. What tiering means is that it will start transferring data between the hard drives and the SSD drives. And when you set it up an automatic, QNAP will see what what time you use the least NAS, and it will start uh, transferring data when you are using the NAS. So uh, when you have a downtime, the QNAP will start transferring data during the downtime, during, during night times, or during any times. Or you can actually set up a manual set schedule as well. You can, uh, you can ask the QNAP to only transfer data between the SSD and the hard drives during, a, um, during night times or during day times or whatever times you want to select. But for automatic, most of the users are, are actually happy with that. And you know, we'll just see what times you use the least NAS, and then we'll start tra transferring data during that time. On Turing on demand is when you have a lot of folders, you don't want, um, you don't want to have, uh, you want to tier all the folders, right? Because you can, you can have a lot of uh, backup folders. You're going to have a lot of, um, a lot of different different projects or you know backup files, Mac time machine files. You don't want to you don't want to put those uh, data into the SSD drive, right? So queuing on demand will allow you to select only folders that you want to keep or you want to use it on SSD drive. So I have an NAB folder where I have all my video editing files. So I can uh, enable that. So any files that I work on under NAB 2022 will then be uh, will then be used to transfer into SSD drives. The rest of my folders, like multimedia folders or hyper data protector or FTP folders, that are don't they're not important. I don't need high speed connection to those folders. I disable that. So QNAP, so this is a great option for you to actually understand or actually control what goes into SSD drives. Not all your data you want it on SSD drive, right? So only want certain folders to be on the SSD drives and hit apply. Only those folders will now be transferred over to SSD drives. And under statistics, we can sh we can see what's going on with your tiering when it tiers, uh, what transfer data has been transferred over, so you can see what's going on, uh, what data has been moved up, what data has been moved down, uh, and uh, operations. So this will give you detailed information about what's going on with your tiering as well. So that is Q tiering in a nutshell. So again, uh, and Q tiering will have this icon next to it. So this will give you uh, this will this will let you know that you're using Q tiering as well. And um, with the QNAP NAS. So that's Q tiering in a uh, in a nutshell, as I mentioned before. Uh, users who actually work on a project for multiple days on the same project, those will have the best advantage using Q tiering. For QNAP users who actually use a lot of random data and random files with your QNAP NAS, cache acceleration is the next option for you guys. So cache acceleration, again, um, will uh, 
uh, so I'm going to set up a cash acceleration right here. What the difference, the main difference between cash acceleration and uh, queue tiering is that cash acceleration is not part of the storage pool. So if you look at, um, so uh, so right here, I have a 19 terabyte, right? I'm going to add these M.2s in them, which is what, which is uh, again, two, two terabyte M.2s. So it should be, um, I'm going to set up RAID once, it should give you me, it, it should going to give it, so the volume should be for two more terabytes, right? So if I add this into cache acceleration, my storage pools will still remain as 19 terabyte. It's not going to increase to 21 terabyte because I just because I added cache acceleration. Cache acceleration is temporary storage that the QNAP will use for live data. So when you're actually using the NAS currently, QNAP will put the whatever data you're actually using into the cache uh, cache acceleration or cache files or in the cache SSDs. And then once you're done with the data, QNAP will immediately transfer that data back into hard drives. QNAP won't keep that data stored into SSD drives for a longer period of time. It's just a random storage that QNAP will use when you're actually using the NAS. When you transfer something into the NAS, QNAP will transfer that data first into SSD drive and then into uh, the into your hard drive when, if you have read and write storage. So let's set up cache acceleration and see what options you have to select for video editors. So yeah, hit plus so um one second i'm sorry about that so let's continue so hit plus to uh, to add cache acceleration hit next and then select your ssd drives that you have right here so you have two different options right you have cache type as read and uh, read only write, read and write and write only depending upon the scenario if you just want read only caching you can have only uh copy whatever one only use for read only caching if you have read and write options you want you can have a, when you when you write something into the ssd drives or into the kinab kinab will write that data into ssd and then transfer that into your hard drive and write only if you want write only kinab will only do write only caching won't do read only caching so if you do read only caching you can actually select read uh, rate tab as rate zero because even if you lose a drive into uh, if you lose one of the ssd drives your it doesn't matter because QNAP will always have a backup into, uh, stored inside the hard drive so that is okay if you have read-only caching and you still lose a drive or if you actually if you uh, if you lose both drives it's fine as well but when you do read write only caching or read and write caching you want to have some kind of redundancy because when you're writing data the data is first written into the hard drive i'm sorry into the ssd drives and then it's transferred into the hard drive so while it's writing data into the ssd drives and you lose a let's just you select rate zero right and you write something into the ssd uh, into the nas the data as i mentioned before it's going to first write into the ssd drive and then it's going to transfer into your hard drive so in while that process is happening when you lose a drive your whole rate is gone so whatever data you have written that may be corrupt they may be lost and also if it's a part of a file it actually can't corrupt the rest of the data into your hard drive. So you don't want to ever select RAID 0 when you're doing some kind of write caching. Always select some kind of redundancy when you're selecting read and write cache. So once you have selected the RAID type and cache type, hit next. SSD cache, oh, sorry, SSD over provisioning is a better option. So it can give you, it can boost your performance. You can actually select SSD profiling tool, give you better numbers of what you select but 10 percent should be a better option for cache mode for video editors we recommend all io so it gives you the best performance uh, for video streaming or video editors or media streaming but for virtualization or database application you can select random io so when you select those options hit next um, you want to select which folder you want to uh, sorry which um which volume you want to um cache and then hit next and then once you start creating it will start creating that uh um that cache into your QNAP now so it's okay and QNAP will start uh creating cache and you can start using it after a few moments again i don't recommend doing starting cache acceleration or disabling cache acceleration while you're using the nas it's always recommended doing it after the fact uh when you're done with your nas uh, when you're done writing or reading data from the nas another option i will recommend um is snapshots right um let me see if you have any files in the yeah 
Uh, another option is Snapshot, right? Uh, snapshot Manager. So with Snapshot, you can actually have uh, some kind of uh, protection uh, in case if there is any uh, corruption or uh, accident of data loss. So you can actually take snapshots into uh, and ensure that you have a copy of your data into your QNAP NAS. So in case if there's a file that got corrupted, or if there's a file got, that got deleted, you can actually restore that using snapshot. So with snapshot, you can actually schedule a snapshot. You always want to schedule your snapshot to be taken. Uh, either you can do it daily, weekly, hourly, um, and then you can select the times that you want to take snapshots at. You can also do smart snapshot, which what I mentioned, it's only going to take snapshot if there's any data or that's been modified. If you have written something or read something on the NAS or you know modified something on your NAS, it's only going to take a snapshot during those times. So you can also do that as well. You can also do versioning as well, which is smart versioning. It'll, it, it will keep, so you have three different options. So for you can keep snapshots for, um, you know, last few days or uh, last few months you can keep a number of specified snapshots you can actually ask the kinap to take or keep snapshots or la uh, keep last 10 snapshots and or and you, know, you can do that as well you can do smart versioning as well where you can actually keep 24 hourly snapshots seven daily snapshots four weekly snapshots or 12 monthly snapshots right i'm gonna select um, months i'm, I'm gonna select you can have to keep one month of my snapshots into your kinap nas and then you have to ensure that you have some kind of uh, over uh, SSD, uh, so guarantees uh, space inside your pool. So uh, you have to ensure that because snapshot does require some space to be stored. So you have to remember that you have to reserve some space into your storage pool, um, depending upon what what you, uh, what you want, how many snapshots you want to save. You can actually start with 20%, or you can actually go down all the way down to 5%. Recommendation is 20%, so it can actually give you some kind of, um, you can actually save multiple snapshots. If you do like 5%, you may not have enough space for multiple snapshots or multiple versioning as well. So you can set up a guaranteed snapshot, and hit OK. And once you've done that, once you've selected the snapshot, you can will start taking snapshots. So I can actually take a snapshot right now. So it's going to take the snapshot. Let's say, for example, let's say if you have, if you somebody's right, if you somebody's using the NAS, right, and by mistake he, um, um, uh, let's say if he deleted something uh, from the NAS, uh, let's delete this particular file permanently, and let's let's do this again. Let's take another snapshot. So the NAB video, I think it was video two, right? Yeah, there was there was four different files that were there in that uh, in the other one. Yeah. So yeah, so there was four different files that were that were there before. Now on the new snapshot, obviously because I deleted the file, it's not going to be showing. But let's say if I wanna, that was an important file. I wanna restore that particular file. You can actually go back on the previous snapshot. And you can see right here the file is available, and I can actually either restore this file to to the same location, and I can click restore file, and it's gonna restore that. In in case if 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 a file is if the file was not deleted, it was just corrupted, and if you restore that, it's gonna override that particular file. Or if there's no other file in that location, please just click OK. Kinab will now start restoring this file, and if you go here, refresh this uh, page. and see the file is back again. So that's how Snapshot will allow you to save something in case, even if you deleted the file, if you delete it permanently, Kina will still allow you to restore that particular file, even if you deleted something. So go back, go back in Snapshot uh, right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that again. So in the, in the current Snapshot, there's no file available, but if I wanna restore that particular file, I can just go back to the previous Snapshot, click on this, I can either restore to the same location or I can actually restore to a different location, right? I can restore to a different location on the NAS. I can do it, uh, I can actually restore to another NAS as well. As, uh, I can, uh, or I can just select it to a different location on the NAS as well. 
uh, and actually i've also downloaded this particular file on my computer actually down click on download and it will download this particular file on this on the computer so it won't restore it to your NAS, but I can still download it on my computer. So I can actually access that file on my computer directly if I need it to. So that's how it is. That's how Snapshot allows you to, you know, gives you a, a versioning. It gives you the ability to restore corrupted file, or if, even if somebody deleted the file, it actually help you helps you restore that particular file as well. So that's a great um, that's a great uh, option that I really recommend using when using Snap uh, when using the NAS or no. For different purposes like video editing the last option i want to show you is um uh, connectivity so i'm going to connect this nat via thunderbolt connection so let's i have a 872 activity thunderbolt connection i'm just going to connect the cable so kinabo sh should let me know so, so that was a beeping that just that just indicates that the Thunderbolt was detected. So if uh, you always want to make sure that on the Mac or Windows computer, you always want to have QFinder installed uh, for Thunderbolt connectivity to work properly. So uh, QFinder should be installed. And if I refresh the page, QNAP should let me know. So see, the Thunderbolt had, was connected. Um, so so QNAP will now let me know if you want if I want to mount this folder, right? So so let's say if I want to, so to access the NAS via Thunderbolt connectivity, so you, uh, you have to mount the folder. So if let's say if you did forget to click OK, you can just click on Network Drive, enter the username password for uh, for that particular yeah for just uh, enter the username password for the NAS, and then you can select you can select the IP address or you can select the Thunderbolt port uh, that you had just connected. Uh, and then we recommend SMB or CIF for any connection type, right? So for best performance, we recommend, or especially if you have a newer Mac, just use SMB or CIF. But if you have an older Mac, you can use NFS or AFP as well. But for newer Mac, we recommend SMB or SIF connections always. So select the right protocol, hit OK. And then um, you can select which folder that you want to mount. So I can select which folder I wanted to mount. Um, once it's mounted, you should be able to access it on the um, on my computer right here. So right, the 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 the, the connection is already made. I can see that folder that is mounted right here. So let's say I have an Adobe Premiere uh, installed on my computer. Let's say if I want to access, let's say I want to start a project via Thunderbolt. Uh, uh, that I want to add a file directly from Thunderbolt, all I have to do is um, go to the folder and just drag and drop that file into Adobe Premiere. Oh. And I can see right here the file is already added. So if I click on OK, uh, play, now this file is actually playing directly from my NAS. It's actually not playing it through the computer. Is that, uh, or the file is not saved on the computer. It's saved on the um, on the QNAP uh, on the QNAP NAS. So the file is streaming directly from the QNAP NAS. Uh, and I can see right here. I can actually do audio. Uh, I can do some kind of basic editing. I'm not too familiar with editing options, but I can actually do editing right here if I wanted to. Uh, I can actually do right here. And this is all happening live. It's all happening directly uh, from the QNAP NAS. Right here, I can see I can do all these different type of effects directly from the NAS, uh, sorry, directly from Adobe Premiere into the NAS. And this file is actually saved on my, uh, uh, on my, uh, on my, uh, NAS. It's not saved on the Mac computer. It's actually saved directly on uh, off. It's playing off directly from the NAS and actually actually doing direct editing directly from the NAS it's, uh, itself. If I look, if I drag and drop the file, you can actually see uh, there's no buffering going on. It's actually playing back immediately. Of, uh, whatever I wanted to play, uh, I can actually drag and drop to another timeline as well and hit play. It actually plays back directly. There's no there's no lag. There's no um, uh, there's no stuttering. There's no lagging itself at, at all that's going on with my NAS. Uh, I can actually um, play play back the, um, another file. Let's try another file. Uh, 
Okay. I can see right here, I can drag and drop uh, directly. And you can see right here, I can the toolbar. I, if I can just drag and drop the toolbar, it's actually going it's playing back smoothly. There's no stuttering, there's no stopping. If I hit play directly from any timeline possible, uh, it'll start playing back immediately. And as you can see right here, because this is due to because it's a Thunderbolt connectivity, it's a 4K file that I'm playing back directly off of my NAS itself. So that's how uh, that's the advantage of having QNAP NAS, especially when you have a high-speed connection like Thunderbolt connector, Thunderbolt connectivity, or 10 gigabit connectivity, and using it for video production. Um, you can actually have mul multiple editors connected. They can all work on their own files. Like this 872 XT has two Thunderbolt connectivity and also has a 10 gigabit connectivity. So you can actually connect the 10 gigabit to a switch and actually have multiple 10 gigabit editors of using the switch. And you can also actually have two direct connection as well using uh, using the two Thunderbolt port. Uh, I'm using one of them. Actually, actually I can have another Thunderbolt. Uh, I can also actually have another another Thunderbolt connector, connectivity computer next to it as well. And they can all work on their own projects and they can all work together from the same NAS especially when you have a NAS with SSD drives and hard drives all combined together. So that's that's it for today's demo. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Cody. All right. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, thank you, Duval. And so we want to take this time now to just uh, open the floor up for some questions, uh, anything you have to ask us. Um, just feel free to uh, drop that in the questions, and we'll be uh, we'll be answering those for you. Uh, there were some uh, there are some questions that uh, that have been uh, that were asked before, so I'm going to just go through them again. So the first question is: This been recorded? Yeah, this session will be recorded, and this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and we will actually um, provide this. Um, yeah, we will provide this. Uh, we will. Follow up with an email, and you will have a, a chance to look at the email, and you will have a link to play back the file or go back uh, through the webinar. If you miss something, or if you want to uh, go back and look at something else, just you can use that link, or it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. Uh, another question is, uh, what will be the connection speed theoretical, uh, theoretical and real life on an upcoming Thunderbolt 4? So we have an upcoming Thunderbolt 4, and we will actually, down the line, we'll have more Thunderbolt 4 connectivity NASs as well, but the upcoming one is TS464-T4. Um, we currently don't have any speeds posted for that NAS, but uh, because it's only connect coming with the 4-bay, it's only a 4-bay NAS, and it's only... Uh, Intel Celeron processor, so um, the theoretical or uh, max speed may not be that much um, compared to uh, uh, compared to previous generation, or it won't saturate the Thunderbolt 4 connectivity. So uh, even if you have all SSD drives, it may it, because it may be limited to the Intel processor itself. So, um, um, but I, unfortunately, I don't have any numbers to give you right now. Another question is. Uh, we have a, a 3.0 inch uh, hard drive NAS, and is, what recommended drives we recommend is Ironwool, Ironwool for Pro, uh, for Rest and Digital, Red or Red Pro. Um, so Ironwool and Ironwool Pro are both uh, recommended models. Uh, I think it's listed on a recommended models for our, for all of our NASs. For smaller bay NASs, like two, four bays, I think Ironwool is okay to use. Uh, for larger bay NAS, I think Armour Pro would be a better option. Pro gives you better ability to have higher bay NASs, maybe 12, 24 bays, and also gives you, I think, has better warranty information as well as, well as better um, specs as well. So Pro would be recommended for higher bay models. I think Armour is more than enough for a smaller bay, like two, four, six bay NASs. Do all the NAS come with drive predict failure prediction? Uh, John, unfortunately, no drive prediction is a... a is a combination effort from Ulink uh, DA Drive Analyzer. It's the, it requires a license, so it's not available for all of our NASs. We actually have an upcoming webinar, which is the next webinar sometime in first week of May, that actually dives deep into the DA, DA Drive Analyzer. So hopefully we'll, you'll be able to see you there as well, to, and you can get more information about uh, the, the new application, the drive prediction, the drive failure prediction application. But it, not all of the NASs have uh, that feature. It's a license-based feature. Another question is, uh, 
So uh, thank you for the webinar. Uh, thank you. Um, I have an 872, 871T. Uh, it, I had a four disk grade 10 setup. I wanted to expand storage pool, but I could not. Suggesting to create a new storage pool. If I create a new storage pool, with, uh, will my original RAID pool will be safe when I create a new storage pool with the two new disks? Okay, so RAID, one, uh, RAID 10 is actually RAID 1 and 0 combined, right? It actually stripes and, um, and uh, provides you with redundancy. But RAID 10 only works with pairs of drive. Now, unfortunately, it's not just QNAT's limitation, it's actually RAID 10's limitation. RAID 10 cannot be expanded or you cannot add uh, disks live or even after the fact when you're using RAID 10. RAID 10 has to be created with all the drives planned together. So um, in your scenario, you won't be able to expand your RAID uh, storage pool. Um, there, are multi there are a couple of options you can actually do. Um, because you have an 871, 871XT, you can actually if you only have two more drives, you can actually create another storage pool, create another volume, and just use another folder for that particular two disk. If you are able to add four more disks, you can potentially create another RAID 10 and add them in the same storage pool. So the storage pool now will be combined with your first RAID 10 as well as the second RAID 10 with four disk folders together. And, uh, and now you have a, a single storage pool with two different RAID groups of RAID 10. So you can do that as well. But if you only have two disks, I will not recommend joining that into the current RAID 10 because that will actually render the uh, performance very slow because we don't want to have the same storage pool with two different RAID groups um, or two different RAID times. So because you can now will take the slowest RAID type, which will be RAID, to, RAID 1 in your scenario. So if you only have two disks, I would ra recommend waiting to get another two more disks um, if you are unable to wait, then just set up another storage pool, read rate one. Another question, if I have, um, if you have a QNAP with two power supplies, are you able to get an alarm if one is broken? Oh, I think, okay, I think what you mean, um, I don't think it beeps when you have a power supply that fails, but QNAP will actually change the status light in orange or red when another when a power supply fails and also it actually uh, lets you know in the in the logs that you have a failed power supply so if you do have a failed power supply and you you, know, you can actually look in front of your nas to see if there is any orange or red light or you can actually go into storage pool i'm sorry in your system logs and see uh if, what kind of error message you have you can also set up notification uh, on the notification center, you can actually set up, you can just uh, use your email address. The QNAP will actually send you an email when there is a power supply that has failed. Uh, that's on the notification center. Then you actually send you email. Unfortunately, I have a rack mount that I can show you live, but you can actually do that as well. What is the best performance settings for an 8 NAS SSD RAID 5 or RAID 6 or RAID 10 on all hard drives? Um, I would recommend RAID 5 for, uh, so as I mentioned before, I was. Uh, I'm hoping that you're actually decided with my previous example if you want, if you want to use RAID uh, Q tier or SSG caching, but I would recommend RAID five for both of them. Um, that actually that will give you better performance um, for A B and S, but you have hard drives and SSG combined or hybrid setup. That is all for the questions uh, today. Um, we're gonna keep the. Uh, session or webinar live for two more minutes. If you have any further questions, just keep asking away. Um, if not, then uh, we'll just end the webinar and thank you all for joining, but we'll wait for two more minutes. Now, before we go, I just want to make sure we have, uh, we want to announce something for the upcoming NAB show. Um, yeah, so uh, if you're familiar with NAB, uh, it's a major trade show for uh, video production, uh, National Ameri American Broadcaster Show. Uh, we It's going to be April 24th to April 27th at the Las Vegas Convention Center, and we'll be, uh, we'll be exhibiting there. So if you want to stop by, if you're there, uh, we're booth number N4032. So uh, we'd love to see you there. We'd love to talk with you there. Uh, and, you know, it, we can have a more in-depth discussion uh, in person if you happen to be there.
Yeah. Well, I'll be there at the at the show. If you guys have any questions, yeah, I always ask with the ball. Uh, and I'll be happy to show you what's new with us. Uh, we'll be showcasing our um, uh, the new Thunderbolt key for NAS, as well as um, uh, as well as all, all Flash NAS as well that we have the upcoming all Flash NAS. So and also direct connectivity as well. So a lot more options that we'll uh, demo during the show, and I'll also be able to ha help you answer all the questions as well. Um, if you have another questions, what's the difference between SSD caching and queuing? So I did went through uh, my demo, but just a quick, um, the, just a quick recap. Um, SSD caching again is temporary storage, so it's not going to be added into your storage pool. And we recommend uh, for users who use a lot of random files. Uh, they work on a different projects uh, at different times. And they're not using the same file over and over again for multiple days. They're just working on a, on the same file for maybe a couple of hours, and then just starting another project, another work, another file, uh, another file, maybe another project. Uh, but they're not working on the same file over and over again for multiple days. Uh, SSD caching is for you guys. But if you're actually working on the same file for multiple days, or if, uh, there's a project that you're actually working on for multiple days and is actually have multiple files, SSD uh, uh, queuing is for you because queuing will 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 keep that file in, stored in the SSD caching for multiple days, and it's actually will be part of your storage pool rather than just be a random storage. So hopefully that answers that question quickly. Uh, so follow up question: Will both will save a copy of the file in S, uh, HDD pool? No, Q, uh, SSD caching, again, if you have read cache, then yes, there will be a copy of the file in the uh, hard drive. If you have write cache, Kinect will first copy that file into SSD, and then it will uh, slowly transfer that into hard drive, or that's called flushing. So um, so that that's how SSD caching will work. For Qtier, no. Qtier will keep a copy. So Qtier will only keep one copy. Either it will be on, on, the, hard, on the SSD drive or will be on hard drive. So because... SSD is now part of your storage pool. It's another RAID group. Now, and it's actually not a temporary storage, it's actually permanent storage. You now will keep a, keep whatever file you're actually using on the SSD drive. So definitely you want a redundancy, uh, maybe RAID 5, RAID 10 on SSD as well. And then whatever projects you're not using will be on hard drive. So, but there's no, it won't be two different copies. It will be just one copy on Q tiering. And for SSD caching, uh, read cache will have multiple copies. Write cache will have one copy, and um, and uh, because once you write that, in, it will be written into SSD, and then it will be transferred into hard drive. But yes, so always for anything write cache have redundancy. For read cache, you can actually have RAID zero. Perfect. We'll wait for one more minute for any further questions. Uh, if you have another question, does Qt here work on M.2 drives? Yes. It can actually work on M.2 drives as well. Uh, with 871X, it's uh, 871T. I think 871T does have M.2. If it does, yes, it does. Yeah, M.2s are part, uh, can be a part of uh, your QTR as well. All right, so that is it for today. Thank you everyone for joining our webinar. Uh, again, if you have any follow up questions, you can always email us at ussales.qnap.com um, and we'll be happy to assist you as well. But uh, and look out for uh, uh, future emails for our future uh, webinars and workshops. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. You guys have a great day.